Hey everybody, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. And as we're doing for the rest of 2020, we are featuring our WWD top projects for 2020. Today I have with me Sharon Foley. She is Executive Director for the Harrisonburg Rockingham Regional Sewer Authority, or HRSA. We also have DJ Wacker. He is Project Manager for RKNK. And Christopher Comline, Vice President of Comline Sanderson Corp. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Enhanced Biosolids Reuse and Reduction Project for HRSA. So yeah, why don't we start with you, Sharon? Could you provide a little more background on the Harrisonburg Rockingham Regional Sewer Authority, including its history, population, size of the system, all that kind of stuff, just set the stage kind of for uh, what you guys do. Okay, well, HRSA is located in the central Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, and uh, we uh, discharge into the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, so HRSA was founded in 1970, and um, we provide wholesale wastewater treatment services for five municipal jurisdictions, the city of Harrisonburg, portions of Rockingham County, and uh, three towns, uh, town uh, Bridgewater, Dayton, and Mount Crawford. Um, we own and operate the North River Wastewater Treatment Facility, which is located in Mount Crawford, Virginia. and that plant has a design capacity of 22 million gallons per day and is designed to uh, achieve enhanced nutrient removal standards for discharges of nitrogen and phosphorus into the Bay watershed. Uh, we serve a population of approximately 80,000 residents and that includes the student population of James Madison University. Okay, so why, why was it that you guys kind of embarked on this project to begin with, with this enhanced biosolids reuse and reduction plan? Um, what were your primary goals going into this? So we um, have an anaerobic digester at the North River Wastewater Treatment Facility and we were uh, flaring biogas. And so year, um, for several years we were looking at alternatives to recover some of that biogas and to do something with the energy that we were wasting basically. And so we looked at a number of alternatives and uh, the, the one that came out as was to uh, take, uh, cover it to fuel a thermal dryer. And our goals um, were to reduce 100% volume of the biosolids we produce at North River by thermal drying without supplemental fossil fuel. And then uh, if we were able to do that, we would be able to reduce the amount of biosolids we produce by about 82%. Yeah. And so with thermal drying, you end up with class A EQ biosolids, which you can have, has much less regulatory requirements uh, for reuse and disposal. And so that was an, also an attractive feature to us. Yeah, before we move to uh, move on, I wanted to um, have you clarify the what what you guys found to use. Uh, you had broke up a little bit when you were first starting that whole uh, that whole sentence there. Okay, okay well, um, I guess I could back up to the beginning. Um, yeah, yeah, just right, right at the beginning, it broke up briefly. Okay, well, our goals were to reduce the hundred percent volume of the Class B biosolids we were producing at North river wastewater treatment facility by operating a thermal dryer using uh, the excess biogas from our anaerobic digester. And uh, we needed to do this without supplemental fuels because of the, uh, the cost of running a thermal dryer with, with a supplemental fuel. And so um, the benefits of thermal drying include uh, reduced volume up to 82%, which has a significant cost savings Plus, um, the product, the final product out of the dryer is, a, is considered class A exceptional quality biosolids that has many more reuse options than class B biosolids. Gotcha. So the, another aspect of this that was part of the nomination form that kind of informed, uh, informed us a lot on what you guys did was the, the funding for this. And you guys made it real, you said it was really important that you wanted this to be self-funded. Could you talk a little bit about the funding uh -huh. there, how you guys addressed that, and why that was such a critical piece for, your, for this project in particular? Well, in Virginia, there's no regulatory driver to produce a Class A EQ biosolids. And so... Uh, the authority uh, couldn't just elect to do this project for the environmental benefit alone. 
Uh, so we needed to find a way to make the project work um, from a cost standpoint. And uh, the project was um, uh, ultimately funded through the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund. Uh, project was financed for 12.74 million, but you know there was a lot of uh, work in between to make the, the project uh, pay for itself. And I think DJ has some insight on that as well as uh, Christopher. Yeah, with uh, respect to getting from, yeah, kind of the planning phase of, you know, once HRSA actually decided, yeah, we're gonna go with the thermal dryer. We actually had to uh, evaluate several different, um, I guess, dryer manufacturers as well as sizes of the dryers. And then after the planning stage, there was a, uh, I guess, a, a very quick four month design period in which we had to get plans and specs ready in order to actually secure that DEQ funding by the end of the year. So it really accelerated us, um, but once we actually pre-selected Comline uh, with their dryer facility during the uh, dryer, um, dryer system at the beginning of the uh, design phase, we were able to uh, kind of work around you know, their, their design there. Cool. So um, what, there was a there was also mention of the local poultry sludge to the system and kind of the importance of that with this enhanced reuse and and reduction plan. Um, I, I guess I, I'll start with DJ there. You might have some insights to share, but then obviously Sharon and, and Christopher, you're welcome to jump in on this. This will be a little more of the technical side, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So Hersa was already accepting uh, the poultry waste at the time during the planning phase. However, they were accepting a reduced uh, quantity. And so when we were looking at ways to actually you know, produce enough gas or recover enough energy to not require supplemental fuel, uh, we you came to share and said, hey, uh, you know, if you actually get to X amount of poultry waste into the digesters, you'll increase your gas production to quantities that will be able to uh, fuel the entire dryer, fuel the heat demands for the digester. And then uh, Sharon kind of went to work and was able to, you know, work with the industry, was able to secure, uh, you know, additional loads of that uh, material. And so it, it's worked out so far uh, quite well, I believe, and uh, hopefully we'll continue that way in the future. I also think, you know, part of the uh, design of the dryer system included the heat recovery on the back end of uh, to recover the waste heat from the dryer that uh, was critical to having enough, enough energy to, to fuel, you know, to both heat our digester and to provide enough biogas for the, uh, for the dryer. And that was uh, something that, you know, Comline Sanderson offered on their, on their the system that they uh, uh, provided us. Yeah, and I will, I will add, um, I guess, actually a question to Chris, really, in that majority of your municipal um, I believe they probably do run a portion on or majority on natural gas or propane. It's, I think it's probably rare, would you say, you actually have an installation that runs all on digester gas. Is that, is that a fair yes. statement? Yes. Typically, uh, we supply dual fuel boilers, biogas and natural gas, because it's difficult to get 100% of the energy required just on a typical wastewater treatment plant, biogas. However, there are a few instances where uh, the municipal, uh, municipality brings in fats, oils, and greases from restaurant waste, or in, in Hearst's case, from the poultry plants. That extra juice, as it were, uh, really helps fuel the, those digesters. But again, as Sharon was mentioning, we also put something on the back end of it to recover a little more energy from the drying system itself. So it's not quite perpetual motion, but it, it really is a very complete system. And uh, you know, working with, with DJ and Sharon's team to uh, combine both of those really provides a very complete system. Yeah, well on that note, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys was what you, how this is influencing the way you look at projects like this for the future. I guess I can start with you, Christopher, you're talking uh, just based on that previous response about 
how, what type of thing to enter into the system to make it more effective. Um, what, what were some of the some of the other learnings that you guys got from this project um, and how your equipment could be used to serve um, outside of the original the primary scope that you normally see it spec for? This is the second system that, that we've commissioned with this back end heat recovery. And uh, there are always things that come up the first time that you fix and you may not get it quite right the second time. Uh, so we, we did ha have to work with the folks at Persa and uh, RK and K to uh, tweak things a little bit after commissioning uh, the heat recovery loop. Uh, we, we needed to get some extra strainers in, uh, but that worked out. So yeah, the, there are always things you can learn and uh, being able to apply that to the next project always helps. Yeah, DJ, did you have anything that you you learned while put, uh, working on this project? Yeah, I would say this one has uh, kind of, at least with respect to um, dryers, has kind of opened my eyes that it's not always going to be as um, as cap or as O and M expensive or expensive with respect to O and M uh, cost for supplemental fuel, and that. If a client of mine wants to go to drying, then they're and they have additional digester capacity, then you know finding an outlet or finding a store such as a poultry waste or say some sort of food waste, um, that's kind of a, a kind of a package you know kind of idea that we can kind of offer now is saying hey we have you know we worked with uh, Sharon and, and Hersa and they have done X you know you have an industry you know nearby you know why not. Install a dryer system, reduce your, your supplemental fuel for your, uh, your fossil fuel cost, and then uh, bring in you know, some additional high strength waste there. Yeah. How about you, Sharon? From from Hearst's perspective, what types of things did you guys learn in implementing this, and how does that influence the plan? Well, I think it's my observation is that this energy equation is not a one size fits all solution for every wastewater plant, and for us. Um, or the rural area we're in, the lack of uh, natural gas as a backup fuel, um, the fact that our uh, energy, our electrical power rates are, are fairly inexpensive, really uh, dictated what we what was possible uh, for us to afford. And then, uh, of course, uh, the congestion has worked out very, very well. And uh, of course, we didn't discuss it, but we do get additional revenue from treatment fees for that. Yeah, why don't you touch on that, actually, the, the additional revenue right quick? Well, we had, um, you know, part of the uh, analysis that RKNK worked on for us, it looked like to cover the debt plus the increased O&M for power for, for operating dryer that we needed to, to in, recover and to have an additional $200,000 of revenue uh, to make it a neutral, pro a re you know, neutral project and from a cost standpoint. And so um, for the fiscal year ending 2020, we started operating the dryer uh, mid-October last year. Uh, I think our revenue was over $600,000 extra. So, you know, it was, uh, I think the net savings for us uh, last year was a little, uh, around $200,000 last year. So yeah. not an insignificant amount for us. Yeah, that's incredible. Christopher, I, I'm sorry, I cut you off briefly. It's interesting, Sharon mentioned that these are not a one size fits all. And you know, we, we were talking about dual fuel boilers and the fact that Versa has no natural gas. So the backup fuel was propane, which is expensive. And during the commissioning time, we used no propane once we got the biogas system set up. Yeah, I was so, pretty um, adamant that we had to be really careful with how much we used during startup because that you know that tank was you know really expensive so and we we don't use propane it's there for backup for to emergency for an emergency shutdown of the dryer but um i'm proud that in in the year that we started operating the, the system that we haven't purchased any propane since we filled the tank originally for startup and we're, we're working on a project right now where they have very inexpensive hydroelectric power. So instead of biogas, we're looking at, instead of biogas, natural gas, we're looking at biogas electricity. 
So it, it's not a one size fits all. You have to look at each individual case and work with the client, work with the engineer, and get the system that fits the needs. Mm -hmm. So the last question here was if you have any advice on utilities looking to do a similar thing to HRSA here, I'll start with Sharon on that um, and we could just kind of go around the horn there. Uh, planning is so important. Um, that original master plan um, and setting clear goals of where you want to be. You don't want to <laughs> equivocate when you are set on a path, you know, you, you know, locking in the additional revenue from co-digestion was really important and um, moving forward with the type of uh, system that would allow us to recover additional energy was really important as well. So I guess that would be my advice. Yeah. And Christopher? Working with the, working with the client and the engineer to minutely detail the project. We did some testing on the sludge just to make sure that what we thought would happen would actually happen. Uh, we, we're working on a project uh, in central Pennsylvania right now where they are have a regional facility from four treatment plants and each sludge is a little different. So we had to look at how they blend together. So the upfront work is so important to get a good final result. Yeah. And um, to add to that, I would say yeah, planning though, um, to be right both um, Christopher and Sharon, uh, it's oftentimes that a lot of our clients, um, they want a you know quick study, quick solution, and then go into design. Um, but it seems like with Sharon and her folks, they really uh, took a couple, a couple of years really look at a couple of different options before RK and K's team was brought you know, into the equation. And then I think we just kind of put in some, some finishing touches there uh, to really you know, bring their, their efforts to, to the next step. Um, and then on the design side, uh, I think it's, it's critical to make sure with the dryer systems that they're, that they're able to run. And so um, our sub consultant, they put a lot of uh, redundancy within Comline system. I think that's helped Sharon and her folks keep the, uh, the system operational and really gain all the benefits that the dryer system has had. Uh, so I would say, yeah, those two things planning and are, um, are very, very important. Yeah. And I, I would just add, that's a good point, DJ, about having the system run. You don't want it to sit there not running three days, four days a week. Um, we run 24 seven and we, plan and I think uh, Christopher advised that to me too. He said, just let it run, Sharon. I remember him telling me that and that's what we try to do. Um, once we start it up, it'll run for 30 days or longer until we bring it down for preventative maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for talking with us today and congratulations on this top project award. Uh, it's been really great to hear more about this system and, and how this all worked and came together so fluidly. Um, for everyone who's watching, you can read about this project in the December issue of the of Water and Waste Digest. So check that out, and we will see you next week with another top project.